a few days before the violent coup d'etat that killed democratically chosen President Salvador Allende, I narrowly escaped being killed by a shotgun on my neck. I was 20 years old, 22 years old. I was terrified about my family's future and as a committed political activist working towards a world free of violence and poverty about my own chances to survive the violence affecting my country of birth. Five long years passed before I was able to see my family again. <coughs> Almost 46 years ago, I arrived in Highland Park with an empty suitcase full of dreams of equality and social justice. In the 1970s, I witnessed the birth of Chicano Mills in East Los Angeles and Ball Heights, depicting the struggle for equality and social justice for minorities and third world countries. Siquiros conveys similar themes in his 1941 Marta Invasor, which I have seen in Chile as a young person. Also, during the 70s, public art galvanized South Los Angeles, where African Americans were creating murals that clamored for social justice. I realized my story was written on those walls and that my job as an activist had just begun. Between the 1970s and the late 1980s, Los Angeles boasted over 3,000 murals making our city the mural capital of the world, now entitled Los de Philadelphia. As we move to the 1990s, I continue to educate myself about the murals in LA through my son. During this time, graffiti art was flourishing all over Los Angeles. Little did I know that driving my teenage son, who was too young to drive himself to make pieces or to wash murals being made, would involve me in Los Angeles mural culture. By now, I had met most of our city's pioneer muralists, and through my son, I had met many of LA's graffiti artists. Not in my wildest dream did I think that I would, one day, help cross and pass the Los Angeles mural ordinance to restore muralist freedom of expression. It was during this struggle that I met one of LA's premier muralists, my friend and one of my inspirations, Noni Olavisi. Um, okay, I just want to, I think this is so important to share about, um, okay, I grew up in St. Well, I was born in St. Louis, Missouri. My mom died when I, this is so important because it wasn't until a couple of weeks ago, you know how when you get older, your life go pass across your your face, or, you know, it pass across your path. And I started wondering, how in the heck did I become who I am today, an artist, right? So my life flashed across me, and I, st I went back to when I was about, about four, four years old. My mom died when I was about four, and my father remarried a woman was remarried. He married a woman with five kids and he had three of his own. My mom, my, my stepmom was very abusive and this is important because I was wondering how did I become the artist that I, the type of artist that I am? Why am I doing this kind of work? And why is it that it seems like something inside me, inside me, knocking on the door for me to do this kind of work? Sometimes I don't want to do it. People think I'm brave and bold and all that. That's not the case. What, what I'm starting to recognize is that we were born here. Well, this is my philosophy, and I put it on you guys. But we were born to do something. Why was I in an abusive situation as a kid? Because as a kid, around about four or six that I can remember, I remember the abuse. I remember hating people. I hated people so much as a kid because there was nobody to come and help me. 
when I was screaming when my stepmother, and this is important to say because it's going to connect to something. When I was screaming and asking, uh, screaming so people, my neighbors could hear me so they could help me, there was nobody to help me. So I grew up in this, in this situation of hate and being all alone. Even though there was eight kids, my stepmother made it very clear that she was going to separate me from the others because I wet in the bed. And because I went in the bed, and because they didn't take care of me, now you can see why the murals are looking like they're looking. <laughs> <laughs> because she didn't take care, they didn't take care of me. You know, I had to survive on my own as a kid. So not liking people, there's a flip side to that. Meaning that I realized that there was a lot of love for people. But I didn't realize that love until I became an adult. And in becoming an adult and taking certain self-help classes, courses, it helped me to distinguish. When you have distinctions, then you're able to have a clear mind on what's happening. My parents were too young to know anything about eight kids and trying to feed eight kids. Being My father being 18 or 19 years old and my stepmother younger, how in the heck did, do they know? So this hate that I had as a kid, and as I began to do self-help programs for myself, then it turned to love. I started to love people because the veil of hate started to disappear once you have the distinctions. I was able to forgive them. Uh, and I was able to just started observing people just the way you are and loving you from the space that you are. So now, here comes these murals. How did I get started with the mural? I gave you the, the little snippet about my childhood because it's, it dawned on me, oh my God, no wonder you was ready to, to speak out for the world because you had your mouth closed all these years. So here come the mural. When I first, first, how the murals came about was one of my actress friends, she got an application and the application was about mural paintings. She came up to my house, she threw it at me, she said, fill it out. I said, fill it out? She, I said, I never won nothing in my life. She said, so fill it out anyway. And at the time, uh, Judith Baca was, well, she still is, the, the head of the mural, murals in Venice, California. Lo and behold, I'm trying to fast forward the story, lo and behold, the application that I filled out and the package that I turned in was nothing but portraits. How did I get that job? I got, I only worked with um, a lady that, uh, Nancy Cox, she had did a mural and she invited me to do a mural and I kept having these flashes like, whoa, this looks like something I'm going to be doing. Had no idea that I was going to be doing it. When Judith gave me this, the opportunity to paint murals, that's what the first mural was Freedom on Way. And how did that come about? Because I had a conversation with Judy. I turned in my first sketch. In the first sketch, am I talking to you back? No. Okay. My, I'm close. <laughs> my, my, first, my first mural was Freedom on Way. I named it Freedom Can't Wait, and the community named it Freedom Won't Wait. Because what I do as a muralist, I take in what the streets are saying. And at the time, it was the Rodney King uprising. I, I worked right across the street from that first mural. And I asked my boss beforehand, I said, can I paint a mural here? He said, no, I don't want all that <laughs> stuff on my wall. But when they start burning down the buildings, and uh, uh, burning down anything that wasn't black, he said, go ahead and pick that mirror. Because <laughs> <laughs> you know, he definitely didn't want his building burned down. So um, uh, she, when I first introduced the design, Judy, uh, Judy said, Judy Barker said, I'm so tired of black folks just doing faces. She says, uh, tell a story. We want to know something about your history. I said, are you serious? She said, yes, I am. She said, and I'll be the first to stand up to anybody who goes against you. So that's when we start, that's when, that's how the storytelling of the murals came about. It also came about with being across at the, working at a Good Friends Barbershop, uh, which is across the street where the mural is. I witnessed 
we witnessed a lady getting dropped. She was surrounded by nine police officers. Am I going to get my hand up there? And your mirror is right there, so they are. Oh, oh, the, oh. <laughs> they, they actually dropped the, the hog tiger, dropped her right here in front of this wall. I didn't have the idea at first. And it was also during the time of apartheid, and it was also during the time of the Rodney King uprising. But they dropped her right here. Nine police officers surrounded her. But she did have a knife in her hand. She wasn't poking it at them. She was trying to defend herself and going around with all these cops around them. And somebody drop kicked her, and then they laser tiger dropped it right there, and that's when the idea came. That I wanted that ball to scream because I'm being I'm right across from the uh, uh, where this mural is, and I yelled at one of the police officers. I said, "Leave her alone. You already got her down." And he said, you come here. And I said, no, because I knew that if I came, that's our destruction of justice. So I stayed there. So I've always, it seems like I grew up from pain when I was a child. And then now I'm growing up from pain, seeing what's going on in our community, which was horrible to me. And I wanted that wall to talk. So that's how that mural came up. But I think I'm pulling the cart before the whole thing. That's fine. That's perfect. And I just want you to know, if any of you feel like asking questions while we're talking, please feel free to do so. I remember when I saw this mural for the first time, and I was really trembling with emotion because it's so strong. And it really, it really makes you wonder, what were you going through while were you were painting this mural? How did the community react to, to seeing you painting the mural? And what happened? How did it happen? Well, one of the co first of all, it was during the Rodney King right. uprising. And when we, by me working across the street in the barbershop, there, there, uh, we were all gathered around the TV and, the TV, and we were watching the verdict, the first verdict of the policeman beating Rodney King. Uh, the, uh, in the court, they were saying not guilty for beating Rodney King. I didn't have no idea what was going on there. Everything was in the making. And one of my coworkers said, Noni, do you know what that means? I said, no. He said, that means open season on black people. And I was hurt. And then that's when the birth of this started coming out because I started looking at images of the apartheid. What was going on over here in that time, 92, was going on in South Africa. And I was devastated. And so I remember what Judy said. She says, tell the story. So I started listening to what the community was saying. He said open season on black people. He, they were talking about police brutality. So you see that in the corner. There was also a, a young man, actually an image from downtown where they were protesting. People were yelling, no justice, no peace. And there were actually policemen patrol, patrolling that area because we were sitting down fine. Not we, I didn't do it. But <laughs> let's get that straight. But it was being set on fire. So this, I wanted to show that. I wanted to express what I was hearing, what I was seeing, and I was afraid. Because when you look outside of your home and you see something burning and it's real close to you, something's going on that the world needs to hear. What's happening to us? Well, that's exactly what the mural is supposed to do, you know? The mural is supposed to tell the history of our community. A mural is supposed to uh, educate the passers-by. A mural is supposed to talk to you. You don't need to read anything. You just look at this mural, and you have an idea of what's happening. That's the power of mural. That's the power that I felt when I look at this mural, that's the power that I felt when I saw cicadas the first time I saw uh, murals. Uh, the, the one in Chile, uh, which is called Death to the Invader, which is a history about the uh, Chile and the Mexican indigenous. So to me, that's exactly what you just said. It's the definition of what a mural it is. So later, you, you probably know, some of you probably know, that there was a mural moratorium in Los Angeles uh, because the sign companies were using, they're calling themselves uh, murals in order to advertise products. So that's the difference between a sign and a mural. A mural is supposed to do what, what Noni just spoke about. A sign is supposed to sell a product. 
So he or she is telling us the story of what happened at that moment. So, so I've been showing you a little bit of your artwork. Uh, this, for example, this mural, uh, which is called For Great Moments, Three, Four Great Moments of Magic. Actually, that was a commission with uh, a fellow artist, and he hired me to help contain that one. So that's not actually my mural, but I helped him paint it. Okay. <laughs> so she was part of Charles Freeman. Yeah. Oh, so was it Freeman? Yes. Nice. It's a wonderful mural. So this one, I want to come back to this one in a little while. Okay. So I just put them in chronological order. So this one is uh, a mural as well, right? Yes. It's, that's a replica of a mural. So that's the right there. Yeah. Right. Yes. So where is it now? Actually, it was uh, downtown on Fifth and Town in the Women's Drop-In Center. I see. Called Prototypes. Yes. It used to be next door to Fred Jordan. Uh, mission, mission, but they moved and they kept moving. So by it being a movable mural, they took it away. Yeah. And the interesting thing about this one was that uh, I like working with people that are considered uh, homeless or downtrodden because they have the information. They're full of the information. It was the people that that actually prompted the ideas to paint what is being painted. And the, the young boy in the, in the corner is actually a, a friend of mine who, when she came down to the drop-in center, she started crying because she's homeless and her son is up there. But anyway. So you have this one, education is a basic human right. That is also, that's a painting, right? Yes. And so that's in the Angeles Mesa's library. And it was a collaboration with Ama Lopez. Ama. Yeah, you have work. Uh, you danced with Alma, yeah. Because I saw the videos that I took photos of in South LA. I think education, the education one. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so let me see. Uh, this one. Uh, there is a D missing there. It's Troubled Island, right? Yes. Yeah. So I noticed that. So in case you want to modify your PDF, yes. This is your picture. <laughs> so anyhow, so this one. Uh, when I met uh, Noni, I love. The, uh, how strong her murals were. So I wanted to do more things with her. I wanted to do something, whether exhibitions. I know I couldn't do a mural because I'm not a muralist, but I wanted to, you know, be together in some project of uh, a talk or, so I invited her, this, uh, her painting of this mural, which is huge. I included in my curatorial at the LAR show, I think it was 20, 2013 in the 2013 LAR show. Uh, so it's an amazing mural, which is about the revolution in Haiti, right? Yes, 1791. 1791. Yeah. yeah. And, and the importance of this mural, and the reason why this, and this is on Adams off Westview, off of the University of Carson, and it's called Trouble Island. And the reason how this mural came about was, first of all, when you're doing commission work, it's always a fight. You always, we talk about that. It was always a fight. You always got to fight to be able to tell your history. This, this particular uh, mural was dedicated to William Grant Steele. They wanted something about the, the name that they have on the building, which is Dr. William Grant Steele. So first they wanted just musicians and da 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 And I was like, that don't tell the story of who the man was. When I started doing research and I found out that he had this opera, this opera called Troubled Island was, he, it was so many years before they could actually get the mirror, the, the opera to be played at the Philharmonica, somebody help me, Philharmonica in New York. And this was in three parts, right? <coughs> yes, it was in three parts. Reason why they didn't want this mural because it was uh, the first country that had, that overturned the almighty, what, uh, Help, help with the <laughs> French. <laughs> French. Um, French. Yeah, they, they I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself because there's so much I have to say. <laughs> Let me just say that the United States shunned this opera and any story about it to come in this country because they were fear, they were fearful that the blacks here would do an uprising and oh, because they defeated they defeated Napoleon. They defeated the French army. 
it was like a handful of enslaved. And I always use the word enslaved because we didn't come over here enslaved. We were enslaved, our ancestors. So I always use, I try to educate in the sense of, let's get the story correct. I'm not a slave. And my, my ancestors not weren't either. So what I what 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 they what the United States feared was that if we know anything about this, and that's why I wanted to put it on the wall, because we need to stop being afraid of, to tell our stories, because our stories count, because that's what's missing in the world today is that we don't talk enough about who we are, but we learn so much about others. But I want to learn about each, and that's the purpose of having murals like that so we can educate each other. It's not to go against each other, but it's to educate each other. So by, for over so many years, the United States didn't want this story to come out. And so again, I'm in the in culture's affairs trying to fight for having a mural coming out. So, but anyway, um, uh, I met, the beautiful thing about doing murals also is that you get a chance to meet the actual people. I met William Grant Steele's daughter and she gave me CDs and she gave me CDs of this particular opera and I listened to the story and the story is amazing because she feels to this day that the death of her father was because of this opera mm -hmm. and because they reduced, when I say they, the system reduced his music down from operas to background music like Gunsmoke, uh, some of these other little sick movies, I mean, little shows that we, we used to see about Gunsmoke, Diligent, or something like that. But um, they reduced his work down and they didn't even allow him to do his operas anymore after this. And another thing, they had, when they did allow him to do these murals at he, after he fought for so many years, they didn't allow black folks to do, take, play the part. It was all done in black face. White folks, black faces. So that, yeah, that was a huge issue that we are dealing with right now. That's the importance that, of why yeah. this mural was even came about. I wanted more of uh, who he was and what he stood for <coughs> than just musicians. So we're going to Absolutely. We needed to, we need to learn all these, you know, it's so important to all of us what you have gone through in order to create this incredible mural. So this one that we're looking at right now, it's uh, resurre Resurrection, that's the detail. This is the one that you painted with Raul Gonzalez, right? Yes. Which brings me to the fact that it was so great when I learned that you went to the Bellas Artes in Mexico City uh, with Blossom and Raul Gonzalez. Yeah. And what a great way to go to Bellas Artes with two of the younger generation artists and you know to see you i'm sure you saw the artists of the three greats in there they all the beautiful and i walking into that place it's like i imagine you know incredible for you oh my god they could have closed me up and locked me up in there the work is so <laughs> beautiful i did not want to leave but because we were with a group you know you had to leave but i could have stayed there you could have just locked me up there and just let me just marvel over the work and also, I want to give credit that the four, the three great grandes, is that how you put the three grandes? Yes. Cicado, 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 Juan Rivera. Yes. Oh my God. That's where the inspiration came for me to want to paint like a kid because they told stories. They told stories. So they're some of my great, along with, I want to give credit to, as a kid growing up, teenager growing up, Emory Douglas. And Emory Douglas was the, the artist for the Black Panther Party. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was oh my the God! Yeah. And I have to say something about the Artes, okay? okay? I was very lucky to go to uh, Mexico City to an opening of a very important exhibition of which one of the artists is sitting right here, Patrick Martinez. And <laughs> we tried, we tried. I have to say every day, that we did, we were there, I know, seven, ten days. Every day after four, it was raining. So every day we had commitments with the openings, uh, the talks, or whatever. So we did try to go. We went, and then it was closed. And here I am, somebody who wrote her thesis about cicadas, and I love, love, love the three grades. And we just were there, took pictures of the building, were in front of the building, and it was like, we have to go back. 
Maria project, then we got to go back and see that. Yeah. So I can imagine how you felt oh. when, when you were there. No, oh. well, you didn't get to see. Well, but you know, like I, I had studied those murals in books, which is never the same. Oh. But I, I, each mural, I, I memorized areas. I had analyzed everyone, you know, grid by grid, because I had to in my studies of uh, art history. So I know that if I would walk in there and I'd be crying because that's what I did a lot of the time. We were looking at things in Mexico and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm in front of, you know, this art. Yes. Where so, is this real? The, the previous one. Where is that? Oh, it's tore down. Dorsey High School. It's Dorsey High School. I'm so hurt that it's tore down. Nobody told me that. They were going to tear it down, but good thing that my good friend and some of you know on Bully Meadowbrook did a documentation on it, so we have, me and Ronald have, do have photographs. But they tore it down. They could have moved the building, but sometimes I think, and I'm not going to be afraid to uh, voice my opinion anymore, but sometimes I think my big mouth gets me in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. But, but you know, the, about this, and uh, Judith, you asked a question, and when I learned that the mural had been erased, I asked how long ago, 10 years ago, because, you know, uh, Murals cannot be just erased, and you know they're, they're, the artists and murals have rights, and uh, it's illegal. They need their 90 days uh, to remove the mural, and so that's what the mural ordinance speaks about. So you know that's an issue that I asked Noni how long ago. He said you did it with Raúl. Raúl knows everything about this, but it was too long ago, and they had an idea that something was going to happen or something. So they uh, built the gym. Yes. Yeah, so. And this one, it takes a village to raise a child. This one, it's uh, um, it's Ama, and this is the one at the at uh, Council Member Price's uh, office. Oh, no, no, that was that was the, the part where he worked, used to work in. Uh, Catherine, what is that? Uh, what's that councilman's name? Uh, Gilbert. Yeah, Gilbert, Gilbert Benson Park. Oh, that's a, that's or is it that in that office? Mm -hmm. That's the, that's the one at the Consuelo Price. I saw that one with Alma Lopez and, and your mural your murals in there. So this was a commission mural? Or? Yes, commission. And that one is, is so interesting because the historical image of the zoot suits, the hand is really originally on the, is it on the outside? I no. think the city hand no, has to change. Is inside, this is when you enter in this office. Yeah. This is the in, I mean, entering the zoo. Right. Do, is anybody familiar with the zoo, that zoo suit picture? Is the hand on the inside or the yes. outside? The, I think the hand. Because the whichever hand way it, it, it <coughs> went, the city had us to change it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and yeah. But it's a beautiful piece, and I'll, I love, you know, how powerful they become because your usage of colors, as Judith mentioned earlier, you know, the black, the white, and the red is just makes them even more powerful. This is the one outside. Yes, that's the one outside. And that's Alma Lopez and, and you right? Right. Yeah. So how did you, how did it happen that you partnered with Alma in this? Uh, she worked at Spark. Ah, so I see. <laughs> she worked at Spark and she was like, let's do something together. I like your murals and I like yours too. Let's go for it. And Alma was, the, I always considered her, she was the mouthpiece. She knows she knows how structure and all of that stuff goes. So the only thing I had to do was paint, which was right up my alley. <laughs> was it Alma uh, the one that restored your mural? They both did. Yeah, on Noni too. So you and Alma restored. What's the name of the mural? Uh, the, uh, this is Judith Hernandez, by the way, for the one. Incredible, by the way, she got a mural. And they had a police riot at their meeting at, 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 during the restoration the way I had one of the original. Yes, did amazing. they arrest anybody? Huh? Did they arrest anybody? I don't think so. I don't think so. <coughs> they arrested like six of my kids that And the interesting thing about her mural was I'm a black person. <laughs> and the gangs lined up. They lined up to protect that mural. They wanted to know who I am messing with this mural. This is our mural and I'm going to have to step in real quick. <laughs> this is Judith Hernandez's mural. Don't touch it. 
And almost that thing real quick, and next thing you know, they invited us. You know, and I like the fact that when you include uh, the community in the work, they they safeguard it for sure. Well, that's that's exactly what I was talking to Melvia earlier. The whole secret of preserving a mural, more than restoring it, is giving a sense of ownership to the community. When the community feels part of it, when you include the artists from the community, and when you make the community part of the whole project, that's when the mural is the best way to preserve it in our work. So that's exactly what happened there. Right? So this one, this one, it's in uh, the art district, and I gave a lot of mural tours uh, in that community for many years. And I was very happy when I heard that Noni was going to paint this mural because I look at all the murals there, and there weren't any African Americans that had painted in that community, in that part of downtown LA, in the art district. So, and women, they were only Key West. You had a little mural. And here's another fabulous artist right here, Colette Miller. Uh, you probably have seen her name. So uh, she travels all over the world uh, with this incredible project that is so good to the heart. Thank you for that. So, uh, but anyhow, so uh, going back to this mural. So, and what was the name of the theme? The Cornerstone. 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 Oh, you. That's right. And she brought me three. So you were that right then? You were in the office at Cornerstone? No, the office, the no. Cornerstone? no. Uh, no um, uh, our studio. Kima Velez, by the way. Right here. Another yeah. thing. Oh. Thank you. 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 Thank but the whole idea was that they had plays that they would do in the community. And this was part of, it was supposed to be an ongoing play, plays, and they would give artists the opportunity to paint on their, on their garage, or on the door. Yes. The door. But they ended up liking this, and they kept it. And this was, their, this was my dedication to the farmers. Right. Uh, in Alameda, the farmers South that Central Farm. The, the African Americans and the Latinos had this farm where they produce all these vegetables, right? For yeah. free to the people. Yeah. And they, they destroyed that, right? right? But that was part of the script, the play that they were playing at Cornerstone, right? That's right. what. And you, right. my understanding was that you read the script. Uh, well, I read the script and it was so closely related to what was happening in South Central when they when they bulldozed all of that farmland and vegetation and herbs and everything that could sustain a community and was doing that. And what's so tragic is that they never, I don't think they ever feel anything on them. No, no that's just right. point. Like there's nothing but there. just to do that to the people who were crying and hurting. And, and <clears> this was my, in a small space, dedication to and honoring. Uh, Look at who is there. <laughs> you know, so I wanted to give a little snippet. It's like you may you may do this to us, but we still rise. Yeah. Was it, was it the, the young man? I, I thought he was an artist. He, he started that that farming, uh, you know, trend in, in South Central. He needed some strips. Oh, yeah, Ron Finley. 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 Yeah, Finley. 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 But that he did that much later. Oh, okay. After when we were working the mirror ordinance at City Hall. Uh, that's what I met him, and I began oh, helping him with that ordinance that allowed the people in South Los Angeles to make that. Oh, yeah. that. No, but no, it was way ahead of that. Yes. Time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but this is in 2012. This is the day the unveiling of this mural. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't give her the flowers. I just I was part of the uh, the audience. But uh, anyhow, it was a beautiful occasion, and and I was so proud and happy. Uh, that you were there, that, that your artworks were there. So, you know, to bring our communities together. So it was fantastic. So I love this one. But that's this is a painting. That is a painting, but I love it. This is my son and his son. I'm a uh, grandmother. Oh. So there's my no son over there. <laughs> <laughs> that's a beautiful painting. Oh, this is the day when uh, we passed the mirror ordinance and probably end. Mm -hmm. 
who I work with, I mean, there are two people here that I work with in Tosue, Maria and Ian, and this is, uh, probably you took that photo of me, uh, the day we passed the mirror ordinance that restored the mirror with freedom of expression. They were finally able to, to you know, paint murals and the younger generation. Uh, there was a time when they were taking them to jail or the parents had to pay high fines for uh, being caught in the street painting. So when we passed the mirror ordinance, which it wasn't easy, we worked for three years, Noni was an active participant of those meetings uh, that uh, brought attention to the city that we needed to have that uh, make the murals legal again in a way. During, during the decade long that this mirror, the moratorium on mural, our history, our mural history really was erased because we used to have over 3,000 murals in a way then at the time of the mirror ordinance was passing, we probably have 1,500. So our murals were erased back and forth for different reasons, but mostly because the city uh, felt that many of the murals were illegal in the city, they weren't registered, the <coughs> Department of Cultural Affairs didn't have any records of them. However, in the art district, when you painted the mural, it helped me so much when I spoke about the importance of having this type of art in our city. So even though the mural was done at the time when it was illegal to paint the mural. So, and that was that was a great day that when we celebrated that. So this is a painting as well, right? Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful. And this one? That's actually a mural that was uh, mentoring kids at Augusta Hawkins High School. So it's actually their mural I just helped them. And this is a painting as well, right? Painting. Painting as well. And this is the one we spoke about earlier. <coughs> painting. And mural. This is a mural. That was, um, I mentored some students at Angela, Ma Angela, I'm not, Maya Angelo, Maya Angelo High School. So it's their designs. This is another mentorship with, oh, I think that's uh, Augusta, Augusta Hawkins High School, mentoring the student, helping them with their design and just bringing it out. And I would like to go back a little bit to, uh, before we open this for Q&A, uh, to the, uh, to protect and serve, because to me, that is one, that one and film can wait to me, are the murals that really, that's when I discovered you and who you are, and uh, it, it, they were so incredibly strong because I got involved with the uh, Black Panthers for self-defense, and thanks to Noni, I learned a lot of things that I didn't know. So I was invited to write for the catalog for the exhibitions of the Panthers in Oakland and in downtown LA at the Greg Escalante, and uh, there was also one at uh, Archer LA. So I didn't know certain things, so I called Noni and she helped me with the name specifically, which was so important to me. So uh, I feel and I felt at the time that our history, even though I was born 10,000 miles away from this country, our stories merged. We had to struggle with very similar issues. I took her murals, the power of her brush gave me power in my voice and my pen. I spoke in front of the city council every day for three years or every other day because I felt empowered by women like Noni. There weren't many women involved in the, among the pioneers. I mean, I can mention like Judith and Noni, Irina Cervantes, Barbara Carrasco, uh, Judy Baca, uh, and I know there are more than I'm thinking, but then you have, you know, in the younger generation, you have like Colette that uh, is making a, an incredible job with her artwork. So feeling empowered by these artists is something that, you know, we all need. Particularly in my case as an immigrant that came to this country, Finding that voice in this artwork has been incredible to me. So this mural 
speaks to me every time I think of social justice, when I think of uh, equality, when I think about uh, human rights, which is something that I had to participate in Chile this past December, seniors like this give me that voice that we all need, that we need to remember what has happened to us and what can we do to change the status quo. So I know you restored this mural recently, and uh, I just wonder how did the community, what happened when you were there restoring the mural? Mm -hmm. How, was it wonderful? Was it to revisit something that you painted in 1980? <coughs> he was there. Yeah, he was there <laughs> helping you. Um, yes. And very appreciative that the organization and you being there and helping actually big time help restoring it. What's so interesting, if you mind me going back a little bit, yeah. what's so interesting about how this mural came about, first of all, you have two barber shops. There was the Johnson barber shop here where you see the young man with the rifle, and then you had hair expressions right there. And how the murals, uh, you know, because it just don't go up. The community has to say what they want. And so what the two salons wanted, the two uh, shops wanted, they wanted something to do with hair. And so, <laughs> I'm quite, well, I mean, there's two beauty in a barber shop. So my job is, back then, was I always wanted to do something to tell us about our history. What better to tell us about our history than when we was wearing afros and we were black and brown? <laughs> and James Brown was singing, uh, Black is Beautiful. Was, is that the song? Black? Come on, sister. Say it loud. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. All of that was echoing throughout the community, through my ears. So then we had to come up with, I had to come up with a design that not only suited me, but to suit them. So I had apples everywhere. So you see apples everywhere on here. <laughs> and what better yet to give the community some of the histories that is not often told in, store, in, in schools. Is about books. the Black Panther Our books. Yeah. About the Black Panther Party. How powerful were they? And the beautiful thing, again, I get a chance, an opportunity to meet some of the Panthers, and everybody's telling me their stories. That's the power of murals, is because it just don't come from me. It's the people thing. <coughs> so people were telling me my, their stories, and as they were telling my stories, I'm like, yeah, 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 that's only a small wall, y'all. <laughs> people were coming by and saying, that's, this is the importance of how this mural come out, come, uh, it comes about because it's not just me. People were driving by and saying, Angela Davis, we want to see her up there. Angela Davis wasn't in the party. <laughs> but I put her up because she was very important in the community and the community wanted to see her and see her on there. And so I put her up. So as I'm painting, people are shouting what they want, even the title to protect and serve. I didn't come up with that. The people did. I said to serve and to protect, because that's what I was thinking of, to serve. The people said, sister, it don't go like that. It's to protect and serve. Little did I know that's the police slogan. How many times has, was I visiting with the police behind me? Painting this mural. It was not an easy task. Uh, in fact, I tell everybody, don't be praising me. My praise goes to the Most High because I prayed every day before I came to that world because it was always something. <laughs> police would come, they would open the doors out and get out. One policeman came up to me and asked me, Sister, why are you painting something like this? Spirit said, don't look at them, just keep painting. <laughs> because they got guns. You know, I, you hear these stories of falsely being shot and all that, and all I did was say, you know, it's history. It's our history. That's all it is. But getting back to how uh, uh, the piece got together, I wanted, I knew it was such a small wall. And I wanted to tell, first of all, the Panther Party started with these uh, civil rights movements, things that were going in the civil rights movement developing and out of the civil rights movement developed an organization called uh, like the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. It's so much I want to say, so if I stumble, excuse me. Uh, but that's how, that's how the birth of the Black Panther Party, you can jump in anytime you want, uh, how the birth of the Black Panther Party came about was through the Civil Rights. So you have that little corner right here 
where the police is apprehending um, a young man that got him down on the ground and that the parents was over there. Because see, my history says that they moved from the sheets to being in the police station. So that's what my history says. So if you, so that's why you have the Klansmen in that position. Um, you have, um, and the reason why I'm talking about that particular area because it was a sister. You asked the question about what is the community said as I'm painting. Well, it was a sister that came to the, to the mirror as I'm restoring it, and she says, "You ought to take that down. The police is not like that. The police is not like that. I wish I had the book because it was an image out of the book." <laughs> So one of the reasons why I did images out of the book like a, in collage form was because of my fear that if anybody says I'm trying to start something, no, I'm not trying to start nothing. This is history. All I'm doing is putting the story together the best way I can with the little space that I have. So you have part of the civil rights uh, movement there. You have you have body seals, this gag and chain. People don't know that that was the Chicago 8 trial in Chicago. They were cited for uh, in, uh, thinking that they were going to incite a, a riot during the time when it was an anti, uh, anti-war protest. So they actually gagged and chained him. They chained him. I didn't put the chains on him. They chained him in the chair in the courtroom. How hideous is that? They only removed the chains because Bobby Seals had a mouth on him. And every time he opened his mouth, he was rattling them chains. And the judge, Judge Julius, I can't think of his last name, Julius somebody. But anyway, <coughs> ordered him to be gagged and tied down in the chair. So all I wanted to do was expose what was really <coughs> happening to us. That we're not, you know, we're, we're portrayed as uh, uh, pimps and all these derogatory names. But there's things that's going on and happening in the world and, and to the people that you not that some of us are not previous to. So why not show it on the wall and let everybody see what's going on? Absolutely. You know, so absolutely. So I, I did want to say this real quick because I, I don't know what time is like. But um, um, but as I say, if anybody has any questions, we don't have to wait. We have about. 20, 25 minutes. If anybody has a question, please just feel free to ask. So, but I don't have a brain for it. So, what's the name of what's the name of the sister right there in the corner? Uh, it, no, at the top. The one that she anyway she I, I, my mind is all over the place. But she led, she led the Black Panther Party when Huey Newton was in exile to Cuba. Because Huey oh, was Cuban. Huh? Kathleen Lee Brown. Elaine Brown. Elaine Brown. Right. <laughs> Elaine Brown. <laughs> right? You know, I'm up. There's so much of that information that I have inside of me that is all starting to climb on top of each other. But Elaine Brown is up there in the corner. And she was so important because she was considered one of the first leaders of a large organization as powerful as it was and responsible for the food pro program. And that's so important that you have. Yes, it's so important that the food program was put up there because that's some of the things that they implemented in Oakland, in the community, was uh, education, free, free breakfast programs for children, uh, uh, babysitting, yeah, and uh, delivering food, medical, yes, for sickle cell, bringing that to the forefront of attention. And one of the reasons why I have the man holding the baby because I'm, we always hear that black men don't take care of their children. That is a lie. But my son is a beautiful father to his child. And I'm, I bear witness to that. But being a barber, I have seen and talked to men who have actually been fathers in the home. So I want, we always see mother and child. I want to show man and child. Because just as much as you may know of some fathers that are not taking care of their kids, there's just as many that are. So I wanted to show the importance of that. And the reason why I got that little humble cat there, which some of the Black Panthers asked, why you got that little weak cat sitting up there at the top of the building? I said, first of all, I only had a little space and I, I thought it was important. But the reason why that cat is up there is because when I read about Black Panthers, that they are humble and they don't bother nobody until they mess with and so that cat didn't mess with, and that's why you see the action over there. <laughs> so that was the whole 
reason why that was in, you know, placed like that. So now we have this young man here to test a question. Yes. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering. So in your murals, I noticed a lot of red and blue, as a contrast when you're working with each other. And I also noticed a lot of references to ancient Mayan, ancient Egyptian uh, architecture, symbols, language. So I just hope we can elaborate on why you chose those colors and symbols, like what they mean to you. Okay, so when I was when I, when I was a kid, about nine years old, because I knew that I wanted to be an artist at nine, these <coughs> words came to me, your colors that you would use would be red, black, and white, and the yellow sun sun. Nobody asked me about the sun, but the yellow dot. The yellow dot is on the, the moon. Oh, okay. But, um, and that they were given to me. You know, I don't, I hope there's a lot of artists in here that understand that sometimes there's a voice or something that talks to you and directs you. Well, I'm glad you're the only one shaking your head. <laughs> and you, you know, you get this voice. And see, that was another thing. My, when I grew up, and I'm going to get back to your question. When I grew up, my, uh, my parents used to say, and this is how we mess up kids. My parents used to say, if we hear you talking to yourself or you hearing things, we're going to lock you up, have you locked up. And, if, and, and by all means, don't answer that, because they're <laughs> crazy. But there, are, there is something that talks to you. There is something that nudges you. And that's what nudged me, was that these are the colors you was going to use. I didn't know why it was said to me. But I just followed it. I followed the voice. I've always been a follower of that voice. And I know that it's on a, it, it appears to be that already knows what I'm here to do. And what I'm to do is to follow it. So that's how those colors came about. It was just from hearing. I started now doing, uh, implementing more color in my work. But the red, black, white, and yellow was something that I heard. Yeah. Did I answer that? Or, or yeah. So I'm um, talking about like the red and blue, how those like contrast. You blue see blue. Colors. Where you? This is from. This is because this is back in the early days. It was red, black, and white. Mm -hmm. This is some of the kids' work that I mentor, and it's interesting because when you mentor kids, you use, you try to use what they're using, and and it's, it's interesting that you should say why is the how is the red and the black merging. Is because first of all, you do. I do hear something that says these are the colors you use, but I think it's interesting that during the time that it's game related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also thought of like blue. Oh, it's see now, I, I don't. I never <laughs> thought or once about that. Also. Oh, okay. Or just like how red and blue have a lot of clues associated with them. And see, that's the power of art. That's the power of listening. Because sometimes I'm just a big vehicle. I look at myself as the conduit for the message to come through because 10 years later sometimes I don't see it's like when I'm doing it I don't see it 10 years later I look at it and I say wait a minute who did this <laughs> but and, and I can feel the force of the energy can't you come through you and you know that it's not yours you know you're being used so if the if the colors come out red and blue, like, like that Dorsey High School mural that, that me and Raul did that they tore down, and I, I'm sad about that. There was actually gang members coming, and as Raul was painting the blue side, the, the red gang would say, we're going to come and we're going to graffiti that. On my side, where it's red, they, the blue side would come over and say, we're going to come and graffiti that, but it never got graffiti. But see, that's, and we didn't even, we, didn't, we were just the artists. We didn't know that this is, was happening, we, who could care less about a red and a blue game? <laughs> we were just doing the artwork. And so, but the, the power of the work tells, it, it, everybody has, everybody has something that they bring to the work once it's done. Nobody, it's not written in stone that just because this is the way we're perceiving it is how you're going to perceive it. Just like you talk about the police life. Who would have thought of that? I definitely had no idea of, of that. But good question. Did I answer your question? Or, yes, you answered that part. And then I also noticed in, in Resurrection and the one right after it, there's a lot of callbacks to ancient Egyptian and ancient Mayan art styles. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering what made you choose to include those because, in Resurrection especially. Well, the Resurrection was purposely done because the artifacts 
that's why you, you see the earth is being pulled up. And underneath it is our buried history. It's our buried treasures that is within us. And if we go back into our cultures, <coughs> like the Leatherhead, the Egyptian uh, kings, queens, the coffin and all that, and the jewel, the jewelry, the treasury, you know, it's underneath. It's like it's buried. And so what we, we, we did was lift the earth up because one of the inspirations that came to that, even that idea to show the buried treasure, which is our history, that sometimes that's taught in the schools, was the inspiration came from two big trees. Or, or me and Raul noticed that there's a flower growing between the cracks. So it's almost like, wow, you can, I don't care how much you put on top of something, you can't stop the, the knowledge. We still rise. So that's what was, that's the purpose for all of that. And that was the purpose for the Egyptian symbols to show that we came from kings and queens and royalty and we didn't, we weren't like the way we're suffering now. But we were greater than that. And we need to be reminded of that. We need to be reminded of who we are. Did I answer that? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? I think, did you have a question out there? Did you have a question back there? There's my fellow artist back there. <laughs> <laughs> you. This is so great that, you know, like, this is... Uh, yeah. I, I hate to talk about artist commerce, but in, in your uh, biography here, it says that your, uh, your murals have appeared in uh, television, music, videos, and movies. Have you have you gotten paid for most of them? I haven't. Most of them I haven't. Have you tried to get paid? No, because you know what? I'm gonna tell you something. To go, I first of all, I don't have no money. It's it, it's this thing called we used to say in the hood. Uh, I'm so poor, but I'm piss poor. I it and don't have a wonder to throw it out on. You know, in other words, in other words, it takes too much of my time to fight. So you have to pick your battles. I'd rather be paid. Keep the money. If it's out there, if it's doing what it's doing, if people love it <coughs> that much, as long as they're not, as long as they're not abusing the image, you know, uh, misrepresent, misrepresenting it, then I don't have nothing to say. And I don't have time to fight. I'm tired. I'm too old. I'm too old to be fighting. I just want to paint. That's all I want to do. And so I pick my battles. But they have been, uh, uh, when people come and ask me can they do it, I've turned down a whole lot because their message that they're using it for, it just doesn't connect. But those who are actually using the mural and putting it out there for good, let them go ahead. Let them go ahead. Let the work do its, its own its job. One of my friends told me art, art has a life of its own. Who, did, who would have thought getting paid so little for some of these murals that I did that I'd be sitting here talking about murals? That's the art having it's a life of its own. So I don't have time to fight. Uh-uh. I pick my battles. But you know, this is one of the things that the younger generation, particularly the millennials, because globalization and social media, they know. You can see now, like, the graffiti artists are paid handsomely for the use there is a scale that if they use the mural for five seconds, it's so much money. If they put their arm or their elbow on the mural, it's so much more money. If it's used for women, so there is a, there are rules and regulations regarding to that. And I have helped a lot of murals. When they come <coughs> from the studios to tell me, we're going to use such and such mural for such and such movie, I tell them, okay, I will connect you with the, with the artist, but there is a fee that you need to pay that artist. And they know, they know. So it is important because it sets a precedent that your work, what you have done for decades, it took a long, long time for you to get here. It wasn't <coughs> you. You had, you have, that's your job. So you should get paid. So thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Colette, you know about this. Yeah, yeah. I think you should get paid because it'll give you energy to work more because you'll have more money to take care of all your normal life. And also, it's like you're an actor in the film, like your mural becomes 
an actor in the movie or whatever it is, it becomes a presence just like the actor who speaks or whatever, and they get paid. And some of them get paid millions. So don't like take you know. I think that's great yeah. if you have the time. I don't have the time. There's so much stuff I want to do. You, well, we would help you. We all can help you. When the time comes, Somebody does it. You just give me a call and I'll tell you what to do and it doesn't take too long. Colette, Colette gives a lot, of, a lot of her murals, so it's out of pocket. Yeah, I do give away a lot, like to like an orphanage in China or like um, this boxing club in Kenya, street kids, and, and like I do like, I try to do like a lot for free, but then I do, like I did Dubai and like no, I wasn't going to do that one for free. <laughs> 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 when their cars are made out of gold. <laughs> <laughs> so I made a deal with it. So Kim, you did have a question. Oh yeah, I do. Um, you know, the mural that you said had been at Dorsey High School. Um, uh, was that the only one actually that was no longer around? That's not really my question, but maybe of your murals? Is that Of what we just saw. I mean, the other one, she said it was a portable one, so they took it, but once that had been a break, <coughs> that's what I think that the one at Dorsey that you did with Raul. Right. Yeah. yeah so well, well, my question is, you know, um, the technique for making large digital canvases, and Judy Baca often, it starts digital, and then they do some detail work and so on. Um, so it made me wonder is that one at Dorsey High, okay, can't someone make that into a full scale canvas digital based on that photograph was great. To what you mean? To, to resurrect it there as something that's then on canvas and could be either attached to one of their buildings or made portable within that canvas. Yeah. Well, I talked to, to uh, Noni actually about the way that many muralists are creating their murals, including to the Fernandez right here, uh, that, you know, as we are growing older, we can get up with the scaffolds to paint murals any longer. That we are leaving it to the young people. So many of muralists, but actually can't make sure they can win that process on Pelon many decades ago. And uh, Esther, who is sitting right here, uh, it was one of his assistants for some of the murals that he created because they're huge. Uh, Judith's mural that is going to come up is seven story high. So it's impossible for, <laughs> you know, I can imagine. I don't know how until three years ago I was standing in front of the murals, getting on the ladders in front of the murals in the, in the freeway, uh, checking that. Lita Albuquerque's makeup was restored correctly, no. you know. Mm -hmm. and, and the funny thing is that Willie Haron, the restorer, mm -hmm. he used uh, um, ladders, mm -hmm. narrow ones, two mm -hmm. of them. We didn't have anything to stop the cars that got real reflected to go, you know, and, and see what we were doing. So, you know, now people, and even the younger generation, they are starting to do their meals on fabric, which then is adhered to a wall. And, uh, you know, uh, so, that, like Judy Baca has been doing. Yeah. But, and I'm thinking so. particular the murals that are, are taken down, but you have a great document of it, to be made into a digital so that you can put it back up there. Right. At yeah. Dorsey is the one I was thinking. Yeah. No, totally. That would be wonderful. Judy? Um, all of these your images are so vivid. They're so, uh, they're so, you know, they have such emotional impact. I was wondering, are you ever going to do a mural that is really going to do the feminist mural, where it's about women? Because I, I see you taking on the whole problem of you know racial equality you know, for African Americans in your mural. But are you ever going to do it about women? You know what? And I've been asked that question quite a lot, and I'm starting to work on that. Good. Yeah, I'm starting to work. So are you saying in the sense of softening the message? No, I'm or saying or just adding more feminine? Talking about woman power and how yeah. we were going to yeah. That was the whole that was the whole purpose of one of the images you saw created in his image. Uh, 
created in his image is a, that, it may look like a little boy, but that's a little girl. And created in his image because I you didn't talk about the baptism. <laughs> I didn't talk about the baptism of 2011. But, yeah, but, Willie Middlebrook. Yeah, really documented me getting baptized. <coughs> and it was so interesting because that changed me into doing what you just said, is discovering myself. Because you have to see, you have to realize, coming from a situation, I didn't get a chance to tell you guys that when I was a little kid and being abused, I lived the whole life up until I got to be about 17 when I was put out of the house, uh, lived a whole life invisible. And what I mean by invisible, I was so hurt and crushed as kids. That's why you have to be watch what you do with kids, because they're so impressionable. And I was so hurt as a little kid that when I used to look at Casper, uh, the Invisible Man, Topper, all of those, and, and I wanted to be a clown. Why? Because I didn't want to be seen. And be, having myself disappear, guess what? The woman disappeared. So you, you don't see that, that. That you mentioned the Invisible Man because Latin <coughs> was acquired by uh, Gary James Marshall, the Invisible Man. Uh, that's an amazing thing that he did when he was 22 years old. And have you seen that painting of uh, Marshall? It's uh, eight, by, eight and a half by 12. And so it was actually donated to LACMA. It's on view right now. If any, I think it's one of the most incredible paintings that I've seen. I saw the exhibition at MOCA, but this particular piece speaks so much. Tiny little painting. That, but as long as we're talking about Marsha, I have one question, and, and I think we have about 10 minutes left, right? Uh, I wanted to know, because there is this Charles White retrospective at LACMA right now, and I know we were all part somehow of the, uh, I've been adapted by the Mexican community, and I've been adapted by the Asian American community, and the African American community, I'm very lucky. So I was part of that art scene with the African Americans that celebrated uh, Cecil Ferguson's birthday every year in his place. So I know as part of that, Charles White was part of, uh, and I know you met him through Ferguson. So I wanted to know whether your artwork has somehow been informed about from, uh, or influenced or inspired by Charles White. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. He was, Charles White could, was considered to be, to, for me, he could render the people so well and make you feel their presence. And I always wanted that to be implemented in my work, to be able to feel the presence of, of, of that soul, of that, that picture, or that face, or whatever. Yeah, so he was a great influence. Great influence. So that, that's uh, something that, you know, it's an exhibition that we all need to see. Alegra has a question. Um, I wanted to hear from both of you, like, what do you think that we, we as community can do to help preserve the legacy of murals, especially given gentrification in our neighborhood? No, we help. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think I already addressed that point a little bit earlier because I feel that, first of all, this city doesn't have any money. I worked for the Mural Conservancy for five years. I was begging every day from whomever crossed my path, asking for money to restore me home. I was very lucky I was able to uh, raise $1.5 million in five years, which I have no idea how I did it. Uh, it's a very difficult thing. Department of Culture Affairs hardly can support themselves. Uh, so we can't expect anybody to give money to restore me home. So uh, I think that the solution is that the state and the city take care of their responsibility. Their responsibility, responsibility is to preserve our visual culture. We are known, even though we are not the capital, uh, the mayor capital of the world anymore, but we are known. We have thousands of tourists that come here every year to see our visual art, to see our murals, to see the culture, to see 
In reality, our history is written on the walls. The tourists that come here go more to see the murals than go to the museums. So it's not our responsibility. Our responsibility as a community is to create murals, is to speak about the murals, is to write about the murals, but the responsibility is of the city, the state, and of the philanthropists such as Eli Broad, who should support murals. I have talked to him about this, and I asked him in 2010, when is our time? When are you going to start collecting Latino, Chicano artwork, and when are you going to help us with our public art? And he said to me, honey, your time will come. We're still waiting. But we need that type of people, you know, to support public art. Yes. I, I, my experience over time with, you know, the public and governmental agencies is, you know, is that they're not interested really in, in providing the kinds of funds that the artists who do socially relevant art, um, they're not going to fund it at that level. It's, it's probably for political reasons, for the wrong reasons, and they're going to support it. I think, though, that the, the big corporations who fund guys like Shepard Carey and these other you know, young artists who get tremendous amounts of money for these big, essentially advertisements should, should, should be told that if you're going to do that in the city, if you're going to fund a million dollars to, to this artist, your famous artist, to do an ad for your product, then you should, you should fund, you know, to a certain percentage, a local artist that's doing something that's community-based. Well, Judy, there is a one percent that all the developers, and that's how I oh, got yeah. the kind of fifty thousand. I'm talking about the guys who spend millions for for advertisements, not the developers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, but I, but they are the ones that have the money. You know, the 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 developers, particularly in that town LA, you see all these high rises that are <coughs> happening every day. They're you know coming yeah, out. You know, all, all of those companies, you know, that make the glamorous tennis shoes, that you know, that that that, that make. You know, soft drinks that everybody drinks, they have this millions of dollars. What would it cost them to fund a local artist to do something this community relevant? But there's also that, <coughs> but there's also this, that the newer generation, and no offense here, uh, that I have noticed that uh, uh, if I compare them with the older generation, the younger generation is more involved with making money and using the murals more as decorative uh, than you know, telling the story of a mural. But that's what I see a little bit now more than, I'm not, this is not a generalization, not all of them, but I see a greater percentage of artists. Uh, but of course, in the old days, I think it's because they can't get paid to do art, like, you know, like like the kind of art that, 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 that I believe, that, that Noni believes and a lot of artists believe in. You can't get paid to do it. You, can't even get funded for the materials. Right. That's why for the ones who want to do decorative art, the guys who pay for that should also pay for this. Yeah. And you know, I'm, in, uh, I'm not really criticizing the artists for doing what they're doing now no, because no, everybody needs that. to pay their bills, you know? But, but it's, yes, I know. Did you, I was but did, did I kind of answer what you're asking? And I think a lot of it too really has to do with prioritize in terms of allocation of funds. Like, public percent for art is for so many types, it's not right. just murals, and why is it only 1% for the developers that are making millions and millions of dollars? Um, and but this is in the same way we got together to, to help write the mural ordinance. We also can get together because that's the power of the community. It's like something that I never thought that we all could do something like what we did. It, it, so it's the power of our voice. We are taxpayers. We are, you know, but we're responsible also because we don't take part on what is important. So, you have a question? No, well, I, I, it's more common. <coughs> I've noticed that Chaka in his ilk has reappeared, yes. tagging murals, tagging walls, and I know it's not Chaka, but it's, it's fascinating to see.